welcome to Logan Sounds Off, where I talk about books, music, and a whole lot more. I'm your host, Logan Kelly. Hello and welcome back to Logan Sounds Off. Today I am interviewing the one and only Shiva. Shiva, how are you today? I am excellent. How are you, Logan? I'm doing very well. This is exciting to be here. I know. Um, it's brilliant. And at the moment, actually, we are at Music Generation on the 2nd of March 2024. Um, it's called We Are Music Generation. Um, and I've done some interviews today. Um, but at the moment, I'm interviewing Shiva. So before we actually start off with talking about how you got to become a musician, Shiva, could you tell um, the listener what you're actually doing at Music Generation today? Yep, so I am here to do some workshops um, on songwriting and creativity. So I gave two workshops this morning, hour-long workshops, and people could sign up and come up and we talked about um, songwriting, because that's the main thing that I do, and it's the reason that most of us exist, <laughs> is the song, which is the most important thing. So we did things like, we talked about like the building blocks of a song. What, 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 what is at your disposal to write a song? And you know, it's really important that people learn the rules, and then they learn how to break them. Okay, that's very interesting how you mentioned there, learn to break them. And um, I saw tons of people going into your workshop today. So I was actually hoping to get in, but just I had an interview that clashed with it. But I will say your music's very interesting. And you started playing music at a young age. But before you even picked up the guitar, what music were you listening to? Were there, actu- were there people who were uh, in your family maybe, or were there friends who got you into music? Or was it yourself just discovering? Definitely a family connection. So my dad is an accordion player. He plays traditional Irish music and uh, plays professionally. And um, he also plays a little bit of classical guitar, not professionally. Um, and so we grew up in a very, very musical household. So uh, when we were about four, we were all started on piano. Then we did violin lessons and then I had a very short-lived career on the violin and I moved on to classical flute. And as I was talking about this morning in the workshop, when I was growing up there was kind of only two avenues to learn music. You could go down the trad route or you could go down the classical route where you were doing your grades. Music generation didn't exist when I was growing up, which is really sad because I'm so delighted now and I tutored for years in, um, in music generation Clare, where I'm from. And it was just so cool to see uh, young people able to come into a class with me and for me to be able to say, what do you want to learn? What would you like? What's the songs? What, you know, and they'd love to learn Ed Sheeran or we were learning Taylor Swift songs or Beatles songs. But when I was growing up, it was like you had to do your grades. And like I did learn a lot from learning classical music, but it didn't like light my fire at all. But I was lucky because my dad not just played Irish music, he listens to a lot of music and he taught me the most important thing that I think I learned from my dad is how to listen to music, how to listen to it with intention and how to recognize what's going on and why something is so brilliant, why something stands out. And so like the music that we were listening to growing up, we listened to an awful lot of gospel music, we listened to African music, classical music, a lot of jazz, my dad loves jazz music. and. My rebellion against uh, all the trash that I was hearing was that I didn't want to play trash. That was the one thing I didn't want to know about when I was growing up. I love trash now, but when I was a kid, I didn't want to know about trash. I see. Yep. Well, now, you actually moved on from some really cool genres to a very interesting one. So when you were 10, you started playing guitar. But when you were 19, I believe you were in high school in France, mm-hmm. you learned jazz guitar, or jazz mm-hmm. minutiae nearly. Was it from a gypsy? Yep. Yes. Yeah, so right. that it's very interesting. How did you come to learn such an intricate and really fascinating genre of music in France? Yeah. So I went and did transition year in school in France. And um, I went back to live there again on my own when I was like 19 or 20. And again, it was through a connection that my dad had with... Um, uh, he's just so fascinated by music, he's always seeking it out everywhere he goes. So he had met some um, Manouche jazz players um, in the south of France there and he introduced me to, to them. 
and I started to get lessons from them. And again, Dad would have had us listening to Django Reinhardt and Stefan Gerhardt yeah. growing up. So it was a, it was a genre I was familiar with, and. Personally, like I'm not very, um, I, I'm not drawn to the kind of ac academic side of music. I don't really understand a lot of the theory. But when it came to when it came to the guitar, anyway, it was very much just like shapes and feeling. That's what I was I was using. I was like, okay, I have you know four fingers at my disposal to put on the guitar. I can put them in different places, and they can how I place my fingers on the guitar gives me a particular feeling, and that's what I really was drawn to when it came to jazz. I loved the chords. I loved that you could like make a chord sound like juicy or like you know more melancholic or you know just opposed to your standard chords. I love standard chords as well, <laughs> but it's just so much cooler to be able to put something almost like mysterious into the chord. Yeah, I know. I listen to a lot of jazz myself, mm. and I found that I listened. I'm listening at the moment to a lot of Miles Davis, mm -hmm. and he in kind of blue guitars. There was none. No. But in a silent way, which was released, I'm not sure which year, but a lot, a lot longer after the kind of blue, on the second track, in a silent way, they actually added guitar. And I love that album because of that. Jazz mm -hmm. guitar, f it fascinates me so much because I can nearly not understand it. Mm -hmm. So I really like that. But now, with jazz guitar and all these inspirations and influences, you've come to do your own solo career um, as your own name, Shiva, and you've released tons of music, including some reimagined mixes, which we're going to come to. But when you were recording your first album, how did jazz, manouche and folk and trad influence your album? Yeah, I guess it had just been all the things that I had been listening to throughout my life. And again, it goes back to that idea of like listening to with intention. And so all of these things came together in this big melting pot. And I, you know, I didn't really know how Infinite Space, the album, was going to turn out. I knew we were going to make a record, but I didn't know it was going to be that big, huge, expansive sound. And I think it was reflecting the place that I was in. But it is it is very a unique kind of style of music and when we were finished making the album the producer Tyler Duncan you know we were close to finishing on it and he said you know I don't know if I could put a genre on this and he said if I had to put a genre on this though I would call it cosmic folk informed jazz tinged post pop and he was kind of joking but I actually use that now in my in my bio in my press releases and everything because I think it does describe it it's it's a little bit folk, it's a little bit jazz. I actually kind of, completely agree. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's post-pop and it's very cosmic. Yeah, there is that. If you actually haven't listened to Infinite Space, uh, you should definitely have a listen. It's just a fantastic record. Like nothing you've ever heard before. Definitely cosmic. There is this ambient feel to it. Really, really cool. But um, you were mentioning there Tyler. And it's interesting, Tyler was nominated for a Grammy. Mm -hmm. Tyler yep. does some very cool music, yep. including obviously Infinite Space. And um, what was it like working with Tyler? And what was the production experience like? It was like nothing I've ever experienced. It was just such a privilege and an honor to be able to work with somebody who's such genius as Tyler. Um, he's a very interesting connection with Ireland because when he was about 12, he saw a video of Riverdance. And have, with no Irish background or Irish heritage, he became really attracted to Davy Spillane playing the pipes. And when he watched the video, um, he actually didn't even know what the instrument was. They had to wait till the credits came on to figure out, and they were wondering how to pronounce the word Ilan Pipe. <laughs> yeah. In his mom. So he became very attracted to this instrument and actually started to try and make his own pipes by going to the local hardware shop in Ann Arbor in Michigan. And his parents realized, okay, he, he actually is serious, and they found him a teacher in Detroit. And he was going to this teacher for a couple of years until um, his teacher said, you know, I can do no more with him. You're going to have to take him to Ireland. So they moved him over to Ireland um, when he was 16. And he um, started to compete in all of the Black Yoles. And he won. He was the first American to win a title on the Bowron. He won several um, Illinpipe uh, competitions. And he then met uh, 
uh, his, his, one of his favorite pipers at the time, John McSherry, who went on to become his mentor, and then the two of them went on to, um, to co-found the band, The Olam. And so um, I, I found it really unique to work with Tyler because I had this very like trad upbringing, but I don't play trad. You know, I understand it. Like I have yeah. definitely an understanding knowledge of trad, but I don't play it at all. I don't. I wouldn't even go so far as to ever back somebody on the guitar. Yeah. You know, playing it because I feel like that's like a different thing, and I haven't gone down that avenue yet. But Tyler then had this kind of like American upbringing, and then he like entered into our Irish culture, and so we kind of met in the middle with this like uh, understanding of of I suppose because a lot of I was influenced by a lot of American culture. And American music and so we met in the middle and he was kind of particularly fascinated by the Irish language stuff that I was doing and it was definitely done in a context a newer a new context that it hasn't been done in before but even just getting to work with Tyler and his process and how he chooses things and I learned so much about intention and, and like really taking our time the, the album itself took three years to make so we spent three months in the studio in his studio in Ann Arbor in Michigan working six days a week, eight days, eight hours a day. And then at the end of that, we finished the record remotely over two and a half years. So we had a really cool setup where um, I was in Clare, Martin Atkinson Barul, who's my piano player, my musical director, and very much my partner in musical crime. And he was in Limerick and Tyler was in Ann Arbor. And we had this cool setup where we would go on Zoom with each other and Tyler would screen share his studio uh, screen and we could listen to his audio in real time. And so he'd be showing us like, this is what I did, or what do you think of these ideas, or this is the percussion combination we wanted. And so I was in Clare, Martin was in Limerick, and Tyler was in Ann Arbor, and we finished the record like that. It's smart. Yeah. And do you know what you were mentioning there, actually, Tyler with the Olam. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about this earlier, and I was going, God, my interview with Shiva, you know, I must ask her about, in my mind, I was going, is it the Olam? Or the Olam, mm -hmm. I didn't know how to pronounce it because I, I, I'm very new to the Olam. Mm -hmm. But what was it like working with a producer who was also part of a band who you um, collaborated with on the album, yep. on one of your songs? Again, I can't pronounce it. I do speak Irish, but just I never encountered this word before. Oh, yes, Kravica. Kravica. So Thank you so much. Kravica. But what was it like collaborating on Kravica? Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I, I, was, um, I discovered the Olam's first album when they put it out in 2013. A friend passed it on to me and their, al their first album just completely blew my mind. I, I didn't know what I was listening to and I just wanted to hear more. And so um, they came back to tour in Ireland in 2018 and I was asked to join them for the full tour. We did like 19 dates in 21 days all around Ireland. Wow. And I was with them for the, whole, for the whole thing. And that's really when Tyler and I became quite good friends. And it was on the last night of that tour that I asked him if he would be interested in producing an album for me. I knew of his work with Theo Katzman from Wolfpack. I knew of, that he had done some production stuff with Wolfpack and I knew he had produced for Carly Rae Jepsen and he had produced for other artists that I admired and so um, I asked him if he'd like to produce the record and I was so lucky that he said yes and yeah working with him and the Olam was really really fun experience because we'd had that connection from the tour and the song itself Kravika I had had it for a long time and it had never worked in a band context any of the previous bands that i'd worked in i just always sang it solo but when the olam came along they like added this kind of like special sauce to the, to the yeah. track and they really did a great job and it's great then that you know when i do i still tour with them we just finished a, a, a uk and ireland tour in january and february and so it's great to be able to go and guest with them during their set to sing that song wow though the olam I actually have them saved on my computer to have a listen mm. because uh, there's so much music at the moment. Yeah. But they're, they're a band that I've been put on my, that's now a big priority to me, especially now uh, after listening to your album. I want to uh, know more about that kind of genre. But if you actually haven't, you should definitely check out the Olam. They're on Bandcamp, they're on Spotify, they're, they're on everything. Just check them out. And now I want to move on to actually You've done some reimagined mixes of your tracks, which is really interesting. And I admire you for that. You're, re you're going back on an al a whole entire album and reimagining it. 
well, some of the tracks anyway. And you've worked with the RT Concert Orchestra mm-hmm. as well, which is a massive honour. Um, just some really great people. Mm-hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so the idea for the reimagined uh, versions of the songs came from, there's a wonderful um, New Zealand singer called Kimbra. Do you know Kimbra? I am not familiar. She's brilliant. No. She, um, do you know that song, Somebody That I Used To Know? Yeah. She's, so she's the female voice on that song. The no way. Song. Yeah, and she has her own career. Um, she was signed to a major label. She's got five or six albums that she put out. And I've been following her. I've, I actually went to LA to see her when I lived in Canada, and I went to London to see her two or three years ago. I'm just such a huge fan. She's an amazing producer, an amazing singer, vocalist, an amazing performer. And um, she put out a, a reimagined version of one of her albums called Primal Heart. And it was very stripped back and it was totally different and I just I was so drawn to this idea because I feel the same way it's like my songs there's like who's to say what the definitive version of a song is you can always be changing a song the songs are always evolving for me and that's particularly apparent when like I write a song it's usually just me on the edge of my bed with a, an acoustic guitar and then we went into the studio and we put like some of the songs had like hundreds of tracks on them big arrangements and everything and then uh, I come back out and then I go to tour the, the, the songs and sometimes it's just back to me on an acoustic guitar again or sometimes it's with a full band with five of us or sometimes it's three of us and so like there's so many different ways the song can be presented and I'm always curious about which way is the right way to, to lead you with the song and there is no right or wrong answer so I liked this idea of like reimagining some of the versions even bigger like with the Metropole Orchestra and with the RT Concert Orchestra and then doing it like we did with How to Change Your Mind where we completely stripped back and took it out of that big space and brought it into a more intimate intimate space. Wow though, those mixes especially are incredible and uh, I nearly like different tracks so I would definitely recommend listening to them after you've had a listen to Infinite Space. But as my final question, you have like jumped straight onto the Irish music scene with so many different genres and it's perfect your album with these so many different genres because then so many pe- so many more people can enjoy it not just people who love trad mm-hmm. people who love jazz not only people who love jazz but people who love, love folk so it's really well done and um, so what tips would you give to young musicians who want to get out there and maybe do their first gig record a track try and get signed to a record label what would you say? Um, well, the best piece of advice that I was given by several people over the years when I was like quite young, and often it was like through like friends of my dad or musicians that my dad know, where I'd go to them for advice, and they'd always just say to me, "Just keep doing what you're doing." And when I was younger, I was like, "What do they mean, keep doing what they're when I'm, I am doing what I'm doing?" But then the penny kind of dropped as I got a bit older, and you just have to keep doing it. Like it's it's all about, in particular, when it comes to songs, I would say like discipline is quite important. That you're showing up every single day to write songs. Um, you know, getting out there and doing as much as possible, and not being afraid to you know release stuff. I think it's so important that we are releasing. Um, and then progressing and getting better and better all the time. And one thing I will say that I mentioned in the workshop this morning is, you know, it's so important to like learn from what's already available to us. So like I'd say, I was saying to people this morning, like learn as many covers of other people's songs as you can, you know, because like that's how you learn how it's great true. songs are written. So like learn them on the piano, learn how to sing them, learn how to make your own version, your own reimagined version of your favorite song. And um, yeah, I would say just always stay true to who you are and what you want. Well, that is a brilliant tip. Uh, so thank you so much, Eva, for first of all telling me that tip. And as well, everyone who's listening and wants to be a musician, listen to that because that is very important. But as well, thank you so much for joining me on my podcast. It was great to have this chat. Um, so I always find when I'm interviewing a person that I listen to their music and I get this really kind of nearly detailed image of what the album is meant to be but always after interviewing somebody I get a completely different outlook Mm -hmm. so thank you so much and I can't wait to re-listen to Infinite Space as a completely new album so thank thank you so much it's been a special honour I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of Logan Sounds Off you can follow me on X Facebook and Instagram at Logan Sounds Off And don't forget to subscribe and not miss any more cool episodes. Bye, guys.